All right, guys, back with another educational video. And this week we are talking about different diet types and their fatty acid compositions and the effects on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment Oh, the algorithm. New study just got published in the British Journal of Nutrition and it was out of Sweden. And they were looking at people who had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and comparing three different treatments. The standard of care, which is basically like government recommendations, healthy diet, that sort of thing. Increase MUFAs and PUFAs, so monounsaturated fats, increase polyunsaturated fats, decrease saturated fat. Then they also looked at the 5-2 diet, so kind of an intermittent fasting style diet, and then a low carb, high fat diet. All these diets were supposed to be about 1900 calories for men and 1600 calories for women. And the low carb, high fat diet was like anywhere from 50 to 80% fat, 10 to 40% protein, and very low carbohydrate. The 5-2 diet was on two days a week, they were eating 500 calories for women and 600 calories for men. And then the other five days of the week, women were eating 2000 calories and men were eating 2400 calories. This was a secondary analysis from a larger study where they were looking at a broader group. But what they really wanted to look at was what happened with changes in liver fat with these different diets based on the proportion of fat intake from say total fat, saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fats. And they even like broke them down into the individual fatty acids as well. But what was really cool about this study was they actually took blood samples and measured their plasma fatty acid content. There's a few problems with free living nutrition studies like this over 12 weeks. One, people sometimes aren't adherent. And two, just because you eat something in the diet doesn't necessarily mean it reflects in the bloodstream. That's not always the case. A lot of times it is, but it's not always the case. But with plasma fatty acids, typically what you eat in the diet gets reflected in the plasma. And this was the case in this study. So they fed these diets for 12 weeks and they looked at changes in liver stiffness and liver fat content. Essentially, they didn't really find a ton of differences between the groups, but what they did do was they associated changes in liver fat and stiffness with the plasma concentrations of some of these fatty acids. I am about to really piss off a lot of people, but don't hate me. I am just the messenger. What they showed was increased concentrations of saturated fat were associated with smaller reductions in liver fat and liver stiffness. All the groups reduced liver stiffness and liver fat because they all lost weight and decreased their BMI. But the groups that consumed more saturated fat and had more saturated fats in the plasma did not get as much improvement as the groups who had or unsaturated fats, in particular, the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, especially alpha linoleic acid, was the strongest associated fats with decreasing liver stiffness and liver fat content. Now, I am sure that the anti-seed oil religion will find a way to spin this to actually prove that seed oils somehow are actually bad for liver fat even though the study shows the exact opposite. Again, it's important to note that they all improved, all the groups improved because they lost weight. But the authors also did statistical analysis where they corrected for changes in BMI and saw if these associations still held. And the associations with N6, so omega-6 polyunsaturated fats and alpha linoleic acid held even after correcting for changes in BMI the same thing for saturated fat. What is my take home from all this? Well, my take home from all this is right now, if you want to argue that seed oils are bad for you, the argument goes something like this. Well, they're made through the same process as motor oil and an industrial lubricant. Appeal to naturalism and also who gives a shit how something's made. The question is not, does the way something's made sound scary? Because I can promise you no matter what is made, I can make it sound scary. I don't care what it is. I can make it sound scary. And it doesn't matter how something's made. What matters is, does it have positive or negative effects on the thing that we are measuring? And the answer is the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats had a positive effect on liver fat and liver stiffness in people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease compared to saturated fat. Then they'll argue the omega-6s, they can be oxidized and go rancid. And therefore, that oxidation is gonna cause free radical production in your body and inflammation in your body. That's what we call a mechanism. And unfortunately in the human randomized control trials where they give polyunsaturated fats from seed oils like linoleic acid, 
In place of saturated fats, we do not see deleterious effects on inf inflammation or metabolic health. We either see neutral or positive effects. So you're really left to get with like this hacked together argument around why seed oils are bad for you when the human outcome data just very much suggests otherwise. Though the other thing they'll do is they'll nitpick apart every single study and say, well, they didn't do this, or they didn't measure it in this person, or it wasn't long enough, or no. If your hypothesis requires such rigid controls to support it, then what you have is an extremely weak hypothesis. Strong hypothesis gets supported in multiple subject groups, across multiple time points, across multiple lines of data, including epidemiology, mechanistic, intervention data, human intervention data, as well as cell line data. And so if you only have one or two of those pieces and they're not very consistent, and your response is, but the government, or but big food, or whatever logical fallacy you wanna insert, then the reality is your hypothesis sucks and it's just not very robust and it's time to move on. It's fine to ask the question. I think it's totally fine to ask the question. Totally fine to look at the research data. But the research data right now is very consistent that when you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats, you have either neutral or positive effects on health. And a lot of times I see them cite studies where they're basically showing no difference between saturated fat and polyunsaturated fats as support. No, 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 that's a movement of the goalpost right there because no, you said that seed oils, omega-6s, specifically linoleic acid, are uniquely bad and deleterious for human health. And now you're using something that says they're not, they're as bad as saturated fat. No, 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 no. And by the way, you have to cherry pick those studies because there's quite a few studies showing that they actually improve markers of metabolic health when you substitute them as well as cardiovascular health. So again, it's just not a very robust hypothesis. Now, I know that making this video will not change anybody in the anti-seed oil cult's mind. But I'm hoping that people whose brain has not left their skull still are open to data and are willing to hear this. I looked at this study because I thought it was unique because they measured actual plasma fatty acid concentrations and were able to associate that with changes in liver fat and liver stiffness. And liver fat concentrations are pretty indicative of metabolic health. Usually, if you have high concentrations of liver fat, you have pretty poor metabolic health. So I think that this was a good study. It's not the end all be all, of course, one study never is, but it just adds to the growing data demonstrating that seed oils are not uniquely deleterious to health and when you substitute them for saturated fat, probably better for metabolic health. And the researchers hypothesized this is because Saturated fats in the liver can form products like ceramides, which appear to impair insulin signaling and have some uniquely deleterious effects. All right, guys, I'm sure they'll get up in those comments. Make sure to say some good stuff or some bad stuff. I don't really care because I don't read them and it's all just more engagement for me. So you all have a great week.